Hey, Humo soldiers. Some of you are interested in scoring some Humo merch, like t-shirts and hoodies, but you don't want to wait to win a contest to get it. I get it. I have now set up an online store if you want to purchase one of those items. Check the liner notes for this episode to get the link. Thank you again to those of you who have joined Supporting Cast, the Apple subscription option, and the Patreon. The Patreon link is www.patreon.com slash leader1, L-E-A-D-E-R-O-N-E. Like with Supporting Cast and the Apple subscription, Patreon donors will get early releases, bonus episodes, and an entry in the monthly draws for merch. Remember, there is no minimum donation for the Patreon. If a dollar is all you can swing, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for listening and for your support. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Human Monsters. This is part two of the Franklin cover-up. Gary Caradori wrote this summary of Alicia Owen's testimony from November 7th, 1989. During the second videotaped statement, Alicia again discussed the pornography aspect of this case. She said that Rusty Nelson develops his own photographs and that he would more than likely have the negatives of the group and individual pornographic photos, possibly to blackmail Larry King at a later date. She reiterated that Rusty Nelson and Larry King would quote-unquote direct these photographic sessions. She said that she would cry and try to get out of participating in these sessions, but that she would be slapped around if she didn't participate. She also states that Alfie Allen had been given a Mercedes-Benz by Larry King, and that Alfie was very upset when the money stopped coming in because of the closing of the Franklin Credit Union. She again discussed the parentage of her child. She said that she is 99.9% sure that her child is Bob Wadman's, and that conception occurred in August of 1984. She had sexual intercourse with him on August 8th, August 10th, August 17th, and August 22nd. All of these sexual encounters occurred at the Starlight Motel, with the exception of August 10th, which occurred at the Twin Towers apartment. Caridori made a list of 62 documents and individuals he felt should be subpoenaed, based on the testimony given by Alicia Owen. The list of seven perpetrators went as follows. Larry King, Bob Wadman, Harold Anderson, Alan Baer, Deward Finch, Peter Citron, Judge Theodore Carlson. Owen gave Caridori Troy Boner's name as a victim-slash-witness. She didn't have his contact information, however. Caridori ran his own search without much luck. November 25th, 1989, 4.40 a.m. Gary Caridori received a call from Troy Boner. He was ready to talk. Almost 12 hours later, he began telling his story to Gary Caridori and concluded at about... 10.22 p.m. From Caridori's report, Troy then stated that he met Larry King in July of 1984. He stated that Alan Baer had talked to Larry King about him, so Larry King approached him in July of 1984 in the Max Bar and grabbed Troy's crotch. He said that he knew he was there so Alan Baer could get acquainted with him and so he could make some money. He thought that he would let Alan Bear perform oral sex on him for him because 
Tim Prescott had told him what the quote-unquote arrangements would be. He said that he walked back to Alan Bear's apartment later that afternoon at Alan Bear's request. Alan met him at the door in a yellow Ralph Lauren bathrobe. Alan Bear asked him to get undressed. Troy stated that he thought he was going to get $50. He started undressing in the hallway, and Alan Bear asked him to go into the bedroom. Alan Bear then got undressed, and a sexual encounter ensued, including mutual masturbation and oral sex. After this sexual encounter, they took a shower together, and he received $400 in $50 bills. Alan Bayer told him to call him that next Tuesday. Troy met with Alan Bayer again five days later. After Troy had called him from his residence in Council Bluffs to make the arrangements. Corroboration. Get the telephone records for his residence in Council Bluffs at this time. On February 5, 1984, Alan Bayer took Troy and another young kid to Des Moines, Iowa. The other boy's name was Sean, last name unknown, and he was approximately 12 to 13 years old. They drove to Des Moines in a tan Mercedes, which Troy thought might possibly be rented. They stayed at the Savoy Hotel in downtown Des Moines. Troy and Sean stayed in the room at the hotel while Alan Bayer attended some business meetings. The three of them had several sexual encounters while in the hotel. At one point, Troy left the hotel and upon returning, found Alan Bayer asleep holding Sean. Troy's mother had filed a missing persons report while he was in Des Moines. He then called the mother of his girlfriend and had her pick him up in Des Moines. He left without Alan Bayer's knowledge. Corroboration. Check for a tan Mercedes possibly leased or rented to Alan at this time. Check to see if Lonnie Boner did file a missing persons report at that time. Who was Troy's girlfriend at that time? Check her and her mother to see if they did pick up Troy in Des Moines. Check the hotel records at the Savoy Hotel for that time period. In July of 1984, Troy was approached by Larry King at the Max Bar. Larry knew what Troy looked like from the pictures he had received from Alan Bayer. Larry King grabbed his crotch while at the bar. Please note that he was a minor at this time. Larry King then had Troy move into the Travel Lodge Inn. During this three weeks, Larry would stop by at various times, usually in the afternoon, for sex with him. They would perform oral sex on each other, and Larry King performed anal sex on Troy. Larry King also wanted Troy to urinate on him in the bathtub, which he did. In May of 1985, Troy talked with Danny King about how Danny could make some money. Danny initially objected and said he did not want to get involved, but he later changed his mind. Troy had also told Alan Bayer about Danny King. Troy then took Danny to Alan's apartment at the Twin Towers during which time Alan Bayer asked Danny some questions about himself. Alan Bayer then told Troy to leave. He waited for approximately three hours before Danny came out of the apartment, and Danny showed him $300 that he said Alan Bayer had given him. Danny said no sexual activity went on, but Troy stated that he later found out that Alan had anal sex with Danny. In June or July of 1985, he went to a party where a 15-year-old boy was in the center of the room with his pants down. An adult male was inserting beads into the young boy's rectum. Other adult men were seated around the young boy, masturbating. Troy was ordered at this party to play with the young boy's genitals. He stated that he thought the adult male who was inserting the beads into the young boy's rectum was a police officer. An individual named Mark, last name unknown, had told him that this adult male was a police officer. The alleged police officer masturbated on the young boy in the center of the room. Troy also stated that an individual he identified as P.J. Morgan was there, 
also masturbating while the young boy was being exploited in the middle of the floor. He stated that he met Alicia Owen in February or March of 1984. He stated that Alicia did lose her virginity with him and that he did introduce her to Bob Wadman at a party held in an office in the Woodman Tower. When asked for further information about Bob Wadman, he stated that he likes to have sex with young kids and that in addition to Alicia Owen, there was another young girl he was involved with identified as having the last name of Hovell, who was a runaway from Chicago. He stated that the last time he saw this girl was in May of 1986. He stated that although he did not take any trips with Wadman, that Wadman did take trips with Larry King. He said that the reason he went on this flight was to have sex with an individual named Ron Gilbert. He stated that Rod Gilbert is a movie producer for a television series. He stated that he received no money for having sex with Ron Gilbert and that he and Larry King also had sex while on this trip. The next trip occurred in a private plane to California. Present were Troy, Danny King, Alicia Owen, two smaller kids, and Larry King. He said that he knew Danny and Alicia were going to be used for sexual purposes, even though neither one of these individuals wanted to go. The two smaller unidentified kids got dropped off by Larry King and Troy at two different locations. He stated that he believes that these two kids were quote-unquote sold. He stated that Ron Gilbert, the television producer from California, is also involved in making pornographic movies. He described Ron Gilbert as an older Jewish man. Troy also discusses Robert Anderson having a collection of pornographic photographs. He feels that this individual works for Union Pacific Railroad and that he lives in La Vista, Nebraska. He also stated that the following individuals supplied illegal drugs. Larry King, Alan Bayer, David, last name unknown, John Points, Bob Wadman, Mark, last name unknown. Troy also stated that Bob Wadman brought two grams of cocaine to the party in North Omaha. Troy stated that Claire, last name unknown, Alan Bayer's secretary, would set up quote-unquote appointments with kids for Alan Bayer. He described Claire as an older woman, petite, with gray hair that she wore in a bun. Troy stated that Claire knew who he was. He stated that Larry King and Bob Wadman and a couple of other men took a trip somewhere and with them were two young boys. He stated that the two young boys did not return from the trip. When asked what other kids were involved in these activities, he stated the following. Rusty, last name unknown, Danny King, Alicia Owen, first name unknown, Hovo, and three others. On December 4th, 1989, and December 5th, 1989, I took Troy to the Omaha, Nebraska, and Council Bluffs, Iowa areas in order to identify the various locations he made statements about in his videotaped statement. On December 22, 1989, I videotaped Troy again for corrections that he wanted to make, referencing certain details in his first videotaped statement. It is recommended that the following individuals and or documents be subpoenaed reference the statements and allegations made by Troy Boner. Sixty names and references are listed. Perpetrators Alan Bayer, Larry King, P.J. Morgan, Bob Wadman, Ron Gilbert, Henry, last name unknown, Bob Anderson, and two others. December 3rd, 1989. Gary Caradori interviewed witness Danny King from his report. It was quite apparent to this writer that it was very difficult for Danny to divulge the events of his past. It is apparent that there are some discrepancies between the statement of Alicia Owen and that of Danny King. 
However, this writer feels that Danny was heavily involved with drugs during this time period and wasn't quite sure as to certain details. As a matter of fact, Danny did not know what month follows December. At this time, Danny indicated that he was relieved and wanted to go forward. It is this writer's opinion that Danny is finally coming to grips with reality. He also indicated that this is the first time he has ever told anyone about the events that have happened to him. From Danny King's videotape, Danny said that he first met Alan Bayer toward the end of 1983. This would have made Danny approximately 13 to 14 years old. He met Alan Bayer through Troy Boner. Danny met with A approximately two weeks later. A and Danny drank schnapps and both participated in oral sex. Annie received $50 from A. The time was after school at approximately 5 p.m. He would have been 13 or 14. This occurred at A's residence. Danny then saw A for approximately seven months every week. The same events would occur as stated above. In April of 1984, Danny met Larry King at A's residence. Cocaine was used by A and Danny. LK and Danny then went into the bedroom. Danny was lying on the bed and LK had anal sex with Danny. It hurt Danny and Danny made him stop. Danny then gave LK oral sex but spit LK's ejaculation. LK then hit Danny with a shoe on the side of the head because he did not swallow it. Danny received no money for this occurrence. At this time, Danny started seeing A again, and A introduced Danny to shooting up cocaine. A gave him a shot in the arm, and Danny got sick. A shot up also. Both participated in oral sex, and Danny received $50. Danny mentioned an individual named Larry Jr., who is LK's right-hand man. When shown photographs, Danny identified Deward Finch as being, quote, Chuck, unquote, who Danny had engaged in sex with quite a few times. Perpetrators, Larry King, Alan Bayer, Deward Finch, Bob Anderson, Gary, last name unknown. December 18th, 1989. Senator Schmidt announced at a press conference that he viewed the videotaped testimonies by all three witnesses in the Franklin case. He watched it with other members of the Franklin Committee, them being Senators Bernice Labitz, Dan Lynch, Jerome Warner, and Dennis Bach. In a letter to the Attorney General, Schmidt said, Members of our committee are dismayed by the fact that no state or federal investigative bodies interviewed any of these new witnesses we have, even though they were discovered by our investigative efforts after a fairly short time and with a very small budget. It is the opinion of all committee members that the activities described and the personalities involved scream out for action whether statute of limitations problems are involved or not. As a result of the new evidence and new investigations, we have all become very, very concerned. Schmidt conveyed his determination to release the interviews in toto for the sake of the, quote, safety of our witnesses, end quote, and to ensure the investigation will proceed at a satisfactory rate as opposed to the plotting of previous investigating bodies. Ultimately, the committee voted him down and refrained from releasing the testimonies for public consumption. By December 1989, local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies received copies of the videotapes. Some officials made a point of noting that they believed the victim slash witnesses. One of them was Douglas County Sheriff Dick Roth. There was still no progress on pressing charges, however. January 18, 1990. A document that became infamous as the DeCamp Memo was released to the public. 
and named the individuals implicated in the child sex trafficking ring. It was written by attorney John W. DeCamp. He tells the story. A lot has been written about that memo, much of it full of untruths and distortions. What follows is the true story of the DeCamp memo and the events leading up to it. In the spring of 1989, after the first child abuse stories surfaced, I recommended to Senator Lauren Schmidt that he go directly to the FBI in Omaha to discuss the very serious allegations being made against Police Chief Robert Wadman by various individuals. This was before anybody even knew that Alicia Owen or other victim witnesses existed and, of course, before Alicia Owen's allegations against Robert Wadman were made. This legal advice of mine to Senator Schmidt was in response to his question as to how to handle things when law enforcement officials themselves were being accused of impropriety. Go to the highest authority you can above the authority who is being accused, I told him. Senator Schmidt insisted I go with him to this meeting as his personal attorney. I agreed to go, but on condition that he first meet one-on-one -on -one with the regional head of the FBI, Nick O'Hara, without me present. He did meet with O'Hara for about one hour. Then I was called into the room. It was only at that time, through discussion, that I learned that the individual in question was former Omaha Police Chief Robert Wadman. In brutal language and with the most somber demeanor possible, Mr. O'Hara made it clear that probably his closest friend in the world was Police Chief Robert Wadman, and that anyone who would dare to accuse Robert Wadman of impropriety had better realize that in accusing Wadman, they were effectively taking on Nick O'Hara and the FBI. I realized instantly that my advice to Senator Schmidt may have been faulty. How could I have known in advance that the head of the FBI and the former chief were so intimate in their business and personal relationships? There was tension in the air. I made a point of saying that I also was sure that all these accusations, whatever they were, had to be nonsense. I pointed out that my experience as a public official, a senator for 16 years, made me appreciate the fact that it is easy to accuse a public official and darned difficult for one to defend himself, since the accusations are immediately put on the front page of the paper and broadcast as the lead story on the evening TV news. But, as if to make a point that both I and Senator Schmidt had better understand how serious it was for anyone to come to the FBI and raise questions about Robert Wadman. O'Hara had us sit down and provide him information about ourselves, as if we were the ones being accused and investigated, proceeding exactly as one might expect the FBI to do with someone the FBI was investigating. What's your date of birth? Where were you born? What is your exact name? Do you have any aliases? O'Hara quizzed us. When we left the FBI offices, I said to Senator Schmidt, Wow, did I make a mistake. Anybody who dares to investigate this is going to get themselves buried by the FBI. If they start making any accusations against Wadman or anybody associated with him. I had no idea how prophetic those words were. It was only after Caradori's tapes were submitted to law enforcement that leaks regarding their content trickled down to the media and the public. The Omaha World Herald began publishing hit pieces about the victims witnesses with the intention of discrediting them and intimidating any other victim who was considering coming forward into retreat. As this occurred, Gary Caradori conveyed his concerns to Senator Schmidt about the safety of the witnesses. Schmidt approached John DeCamp for legal advice on the matter. Schmidt said, These kids need protection, or they are going to end up dead, or become afraid to continue to tell the truth. The committee has to do something to guarantee their protection. 
Caridori shared similar concerns with Schmidt. He said, unless they get into a protected environment where Alan Bayer and Larry King and Robert Wadman are not able to get to them and scare them, I can tell you the kids will fold. They will do whatever those guys order them to do. They will fold or they will end up dead. You have to do something to protect them. Knowing the law as an attorney, DeCamp had troubling news for both men. You cannot and should not do anything to use committee funds or committee personnel to provide protection for these kids. Otherwise, you and the committee may be accused of impropriety and tampering with witnesses, and who knows what else. Painful as it is for me to tell you this, you have to find some other legal channel to provide protection for the kids. Whether that channel is the courts or a judge or whoever, it is something that either the lawyer for the kids should be doing or some institution of government vested with the power and responsibility to do those things should be doing. But you, Senator Schmidt, should not personally get involved in any way, shape, or form in providing money or assistance or protection for these kids, nor should the committee, in my opinion. January 1990 Stories were spreading about the Franklin case throughout Omaha. One day, Senator Shizek set up a secret meeting involving Senator Schmidt, Sheriff Roth, a representative of the Douglas County District Court, John DeCamp, and Judge Corrigan. It was held in an auto body repair shop to double down on secrecy and confidentiality. Though all attendees declared that they believed the victims who testified in the tapes, this was not as much of a cause for optimism as they would have hoped. Indeed, Sheriff Roth had bad news for all involved. I will tell you one thing. Nick O'Hara of the FBI and Robert Wadman are closer than 19 is to 20. Everybody in law enforcement knows that. I know it especially well. Closer than 19 is to 20. That makes it almost impossible to get anything done or to arrange any witness protection through the feds. I will try to help in any way possible, but I am not sure anything can or will be done. These people involved are just too powerful. They carry enough weight in this community to do what they want and get away with it. Sheriff Roth did make a point that he believed the victims. He was just at a loss to navigate the waters of political corruption as it affected local law enforcement. In other words, this meeting accomplished nothing except to bring the roadblocks that sat before the investigation more clearly into focus. The individuals named as suspects in the DeCamp memo had a powwow and decided that Peter Citron should be the one to sue John DeCamp. This initiative was rescinded when Peter Citron was suddenly charged with sex offenses in the Omaha area, with the victims being male minors. The parents of these boys found out that Citron was listed as a perpetrator in the memo, and they questioned their sons about his conduct. Each boy reported that they were molested and or sexually assaulted by Citroen. The parents pressured police and prosecutors to bring Citroen to justice. Given the scope of influence men like Citroen had, DeCamp suspects the prosecuting bodies were reluctant to charge and convict him. Given the attention the case was attracting publicly, they were left with no choice. It was their legal mandate to do so. Peter Citron pleaded guilty. He resides in prison to this day as a mentally disordered sex offender. May 1990. A fourth witness by the name of Paul Bonacci came forward and shared his experience with Gary Caridori. He corroborated the intel gathered from the videotaped interviews. Caridori wrote the following as part of his report. Paul Bonacci's name had been given to me by a Mary Barrett 
and I had his name for quite some time. Upon having Mr. Bonacci meet me in an interviewing room, Bonacci related to this writer that he knew Troy Boner, Danny King, and Alicia Owen. He further advised that he had been a victim of Alan Bayer, Peter Citrin, and Larry King, and had some knowledge of Bob Wadman, Harold Anderson, and a judge who he later on referred to as Carlson. During the next few hours, he related some of his knowledge, referencing Peter Citrin, Alan Bayer, Larry King, and also Bob Wadman. The subject stated that he had been on at least one to two hundred trips and had been involved in extensive homosexual activity as a child and as a young adult, with his homosexual activity starting when he was approximately eight to ten years old. The subject then stated that between the years of 1982 and 1986, he had probably been on at least 200 to 300 trips. The subject stated that he made at least 15 to 20 trips to various parts of California, a couple of trips to Washington, D.C., and also trips to Des Moines, Minneapolis, Kansas City, Austin, Houston, Dallas, St. Louis, Miami, Pasadena, Tampa, Lincoln, and Grand Island. Some of those trips he thought involved politicians from Washington, D.C. However, he didn't know anyone by name because of his young age. The subject stated that he was taken to the Omaha Police Department sometime in March and was talked to by Omaha Police Detective Mike Hotch, during which time Detective Hotch was very hard on Bonacci, and after finishing up with the police interview, he told Bonacci that, referencing Larry King, he was afraid he might prosecute Bonacci, as there would be no attempt to give him formal immunity. When questioned about Alan Bayer, he stated that he first met him in the, quote, milk run, end quote, an area near and surrounding the correctional center. He stated that he was approximately 12 years old and that this occurred possibly in 1979. He stated that Alan Bayer would pay him $20 for oral sex. He stated that the last time he had sex with Alan Bayer was, he believed, around November 15, 1989, in Alan Bayer's apartment in the Twin Towers. Other information received from Paul indicated that he had tried to get away from these people on many occasions, and in his attempt to escape them, he did attempt suicide. He stated that he was very afraid of Larry King's people. In fact, there was a black individual whom he called Larry Little King, who would go around and make threats and attempt to scare him and other individuals. Paul Bonacci indicated that he was really very scared of being threatened. In reference to Bob Wadman, subject stated that he believed he met Wadman sometime in late 1985 or early 1986. He stated that he had seen Bob Wadman at at least two parties that were located near the town of Elkhorn, Nebraska. During the course of the conversation, subjects stated that Alicia Owen was present at at least one of these parties that Wadman had attended also. The subject believed the girl, Alicia, and Wadman might have been together. Other information gained during the interview. Bonacci stated he knew when Alicia Owen got pregnant because a young individual by the name of Chris told him that it was probably Bob Wadman who got Alicia pregnant. Further, he stated that there was another individual who he had spent time with in the Twin Towers by the name of Bob Marino, apartment number 4H, Twin Towers, Omaha, Nebraska. Also, there was another young boy sexually abused by Alan Bayer by the name Peter Fells. He stated that this individual might have moved to Tennessee. However, he was not sure. Paul Bonacci went on to state that he had gone on many scavenger hunts for Alan Bayer. He defined scavenger hunts as an activity in which he would go out and recruit young boys for Alan Bayer. He stated that Larry King would fly him all over the country. On at least one trip to California, Alicia Owen was present on the flight. 
He stated that on at least one trip, he had seen Troy, Danny, and Alicia in California. That was sometime in 1985 or 86. He also stated that he made two trips to Washington, D.C. with Larry King, just the two of them alone. He stated that while in Washington, D.C., he had sex with other people. He thought they were part of the Republican Party because Larry King was trying so hard to get in with the higher-ups in the Republican Party. He stated that he heard the name of one of the individuals with whom he had sex as Frank. He thought he might be a senator or a governor or some state official. May 14, 1990. Gary Caridori recorded a statement by Bonacci on videotape. This is from Caridori's notes. Mr. Bonacci stated that his last contact with Alicia Owen, he thought, was in 1986, and with Troy Boner and Danny King in 1987. He stated that he had no physical, verbal, or written communication with any of those three since that time. Bonacci described his experience with Larry King and his associates. I went in January of 84 on every trip. I was paid by men King knew for sex. In the summer of 84, sometime, I went to Dallas, Texas, and had sex with several men King knew in a hotel. I flew on YNR Airlines and Cam Airlines, normally for King. I never had much personally to do with King, only went where he told me to go. In or on July 26th, I went to Sacramento, California. King flew me out on a private plane from Epley Airfield in Omaha to Denver, where we picked up Nicholas, a boy who was about 12 or 13. Then we flew to Las Vegas to a desert strip and drove into Las Vegas, into some ranch and got something. Then flew on to Sacramento. We were picked up by a white limo and taken to a hotel. I don't remember the name of it. We, meaning Nicholas and I, were driven to an area that had big trees. It took about an hour to get there. There was a cage with a boy in it who was not wearing anything. Nicholas and I were given these Tarzan things to put around us and stuff. They told me to fuck the boy and stuff. At first I said no, and they held a gun to my balls and said do it or else lose them or something like that. I began doing it to the boy and stuff, and Nicholas had anal sex and stuff with him. We were told to fuck him and stuff and beat on him. I didn't try to hurt him. We were told to put our dicks in his mouth and stuff and sit on the boy's penis and stuff, and they filmed it. We did this stuff to the boy for about 30 minutes or an hour when a man came in and kicked us and stuff in the balls and picked us up and threw us. He grabbed the boy and started fucking him and stuff. The man was about 10 inches long, and the boy screamed and stuff, and the man was forcing his dick into the boy all the way. The boy was bleeding from his rectum, and the man tossed him and me and stuff and put the boy right next to me and grabbed a gun and blew the boy's head off. The boy's blood was all over me, and I started yelling and crying. The men grabbed Nicholas and I and forced us to lie down. They put the boy on top of Nicholas, who was crying, and they were putting Nicholas' hands on the boy's ass. They put the boy on top of me and did the same thing. They then forced me to fuck the dead boy up his ass, and also Nicholas. They put a gun to our heads to make us do it. His blood was all over us. They made us kiss the boy's lips and to eat him out. Then they made me do something I don't want to even write, so I won't. After that, the men grabbed Nicholas and drug him off, screaming. They put me up against a tree and put a gun to my head, but fired into the air. I heard another shot from somewhere. I then saw the man who killed the boy drag him like a toy. Everything, including when the men put the boy in a trunk, was filmed. They took me with them. And we went up in a plane. I saw the bag the boy was in. We went over a very thick brush area with a clearing in it. 
Over the clearing they dropped the boy. One said the men with the hoods would take care of the body for them. I didn't see Nicholas until that night at the hotel. He and I hugged and held each other for a long while. About two hours later, the man, or Larry King, came in and told us to go take a shower since we had only been hosed off at some guy's house. We took a shower together and then were told to put on the Tarzan things. After we were cleaned up and dressed in these things, we were told to put on shorts, socks, and a shirt, and shoes, and driven to a house where the men were at with the, some others. They had the film and they played it. As the men watched, they passed Nicholas and I around, as if we were toys, and sexually abused us. They made Nicholas and I screw each other, and one of the men put the dead boy's penis in mine and Nicholas's mouth. I didn't want to write this because the man forced me to bite the boy's penis and balls off. It was gross, and I saw the film where it happened and started freaking out, remembering what they made us do afterwards to the boy. They showed us doing everything to the boy. I was there for about five days attending parties, but only recall cutting my wrist which is why I stayed two days in a hospital under a name I can't recall. Some guy paid for me. Banaji said that Larry King was laughing and smiling throughout the entire duration of the film's screening. He said the men with the hoods were a group of Satan worshippers who intended to use the dead boy's body in some kind of ceremony. He named the director of the film who was picked up in Las Vegas, saying his name was Hunter Thompson. As far as I know, there's no connection between that name, alias or not, and the journalist Hunter Thompson. Just like how there's no connection between the Larry King mentioned in this episode and the television personality Larry King. Totally, co totally coincidental. July 23rd, 1990. Gary Caridori died suddenly 12 days prior to this date. The same day, the Douglas County Grand Jury got together and issued its response to the DeCamp memo. The headline regarding this event on the front page of the Omaha World Herald read, Grand Jury says abuse stories were a, quote, carefully crafted hoax, end quote. This was the product of a 42-page grand jury report. The document was drawn up to clear Larry King of child abuse charges. A quote from the report. We found no credible evidence of child sexual abuse, interstate transportation of minors, drug trafficking, or participation in a pornography ring by King or other Franklin officials or employees. To the extent that homosexual relations occurred involving such employees or officials, the evidence we were able to uncover showed these exchanges to be voluntary acts between persons above the age of consent. We also found probable cause to believe that King, on numerous occasions, used money or items of value to entice, inveigle, persuade, encourage, or procure men in their late teens or early twenties to engage in acts of prostitution with him and, therefore, he committed the crime of pandering. We did have testimony from certain witnesses about sexual involvement with Bayer. Evidence also showed that these witnesses received substantial amounts of money or other valuables in exchange for sex. Therefore, we believe Bayer committed the offense of pandering, and we have handed down an indictment against him for that offense. The jury decided to indict Alicia Owen on eight counts of perjury and Bonacci on three. It didn't help that in 1990, Troy Boner and Danny King recanted their allegations. They mentioned that in a May 1990 interim report, a recommendation was made that, quote, that the Washington County attorney charge Jarrett Webb with third-degree sexual assault of a minor. That minor was, of course, 
Nellie Patterson Webb. Nellie had reported being a victim of coordinated abuse and prostitution. The grand jury decided to discredit her from their report. In early 1986, Nellie began to expand her allegations by charging that she had been taken by King on flights to other cities, such as Chicago and Washington, D.C., where she was, quote, put on display, end quote, at parties where sex and illegal drug activities took place. We interviewed a number of witnesses who traveled extensively with King, and a few made what must have been embarrassing admissions about engaging in sexual contact with King on some of these trips. However, no witness before the grand jury could confirm in any way that Nellie Webb or any other children were ever transported for any illegal purposes, and we found no evidence to support these claims. Addressing other dimensions of the Webb's House of Horrors, the grand jury offered its opinion that it was, quote, unfortunate that so much time elapsed between the first allegations of abuse and the time that the last children were removed from the home. End quote. They were critical of Carol Stitt of the Foster Care Review Board for writing to the state attorney general so promptly regarding Loretta Smith's accounts instead of making inquiries on her own. They attributed delays in moving forward with this intel to law enforcement William Howland's heavy workload. Of Loretta Smith, they said she, quote, suffered more abuse and neglect than anyone should ever have to endure, but the perpetrators of such abuse may never be known. It went on to say, quote, the grand jury found no evidence to substantiate any connection between King or any Franklin personnel and the alleged illegal activities described by the girl. End quote. The report accused those representing the victims as making false claims. From their report, there are citizens who believe that prominent individuals allegedly associated with this case are automatically guilty because of their public stature. They also believe that the public stature of these individuals allows automatic protection and the power to cover up situations. While we agreed that this was a possibility, our investigation found nothing to substantiate any of these allegations. There is no evidence of a cover-up. There is no doubt after reviewing all relevant evidence that the story of sexual abuse, drugs, prostitution, and judicial bribery presented in the legislative videotapes is a carefully crafted hoax, scripted by a person or persons with considerable knowledge of the people and institutions of Omaha, including personal relationships and shortcomings. End quote. As Carol Stitt pointed out, the jury was now able to smear Gary Caradori since he wasn't alive to defend himself. A quote from the report regarding the jury's position on Caridori's investigative efforts. We have scrutinized Caridori's investigative techniques. In too many instances, individuals Caridori interviewed were, quote, fed items of information. He led his witnesses, and the videotapes were stopped and started at suspicious intervals, with the substance of the witnesses' stories changing. Caridori stated that he thought it was his job to find the leads and it was someone else's responsibility to follow them up. We believe to the contrary. We think that Caridori stood to gain professionally and personally from the outcome. Caridori spent more time supporting the allegations rather than verifying the same. Caridori worked from a sensational base. If there appeared to be something that would be scandalous, he was interested in following it through. If it was just a routine matter, he was not willing to invest the necessary time or effort. End quote. If the grand jury thought they could bury the efforts of investigators to expose Larry King and his coterie of perverts, they were mistaken. The grand jury report did not go over well. Trish Lanfear, a representative of a group called concerned parents, was outraged that two members of the organization were dismissed as quote-unquote rumor mongers. 
She was also furious when she found out that Alicia Owen and Paul Bonacci were indicted. To quote Lan Fear, This is a sick, grand jury turning the victim into the perpetrator. This is so classic. A local television station received over 3,000 complaints to its news department regarding the grand jury statements. As the Franklin Committee noted, Alicia Owen and Paul Bonacci are charged with perjury, and Troy Boner and Danny King are not. As we see it, the victims who stand by their story are charged with perjury, while those that have admitted to false statements before the committee in the videotaped testimony are not. That makes little sense to us. Either all of them should have been indicted or none of them. The message is mixed and appears to favor encouraging the recanting as a way to avoid the hazards of criminal prosecution. It also tells persons they can lie under oath to legislative committees so long as they change their story before they get to court, end quote. Witness intimidation was proven to be baked into the grand jury's approach to dealing with the problem of the witness-slash-victim testimony. Samuel Van Pelt, in particular, was notorious for this. An excerpt from Paul Bonacci's testimony given on October 16, 1990. Bonacci. And the other thing is, they kept saying when I was in front of the that some of that jury or whatever, they kept telling me that if I stuck to my story, they were going to make me be in trouble for it. Senator Schmidt. Who said that? Bonacci. It was some guy with a... It wasn't in front of everybody. It was when I was getting ready to be taken back upstairs before lunch. They stuck me in this room. He was sitting in this back room behind this desk. He was one of the guys that kept asking me questions. Beverly Mead, Bonacci's doctor. Well, could you identify this particular man who in... Describe him or... Bonacci. Yeah, he was, had a mustache, and I don't know if he had glasses or not. He was the guy mainly in charge, Mr. DeCamp, Bonacci's attorney. What did he say to you? Bonacci. He kind of told me if I just, he said, he kind of said, if you stick to the same story that you have been telling, you will be in a lot of trouble. The mustachioed man was Samuel Van Pelt. June 11, 1990. Alicia Owen testified to the Franklin Committee about what transpired when she appeared before the grand jury. Legislative Council. First of all, do you have any comment at all about the grand jury and you can that you would like to tell us without violating your oath to the grand jury? Alicia Owen, it was the hardest three days of my life, almost. Counsel, well, now wait a minute. You've been sexually abused. You've been put into a narcotics situation. You have been in a mental hospital. You have attempted suicide. And you are saying that your appearance before the grand jury was, was more difficult than that? Is that correct? Owen, it was more exhausting, yes. I would go home and be exhausted. Exhausted. Counsel, I am going to ask a leading question. Were you humiliated, denigrated, degraded, put down? Owen, yes. I met with them on a Monday, and that was just a very short meeting. And then I met with them on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That Wednesday, I was humiliated. I was put totally on the defense. Totally put on the defense. Counsel. By whom? Owen. By, I call him the jerk at the end of the table. I believe his name is Doherty. I have not seen prosecutors do that in a courtroom the way I was. I was done. I was angry. I was upset. I did not deserve that. Counsel. Your voice is cracking. And you are tearing up a little. I'm going to stop and ask Owen's attorney, Mr. Rosenthal, a question. Henry, did you feel that you were given an adequate opportunity to protect your client during the grand jury proceedings? Rosenthal, well, 
I was to the extent that I was allowed to. You see, in my opinion, they just never asked her any questions at all. And I think at one time, without getting into it, they asked her, do you want to say anything? She says, I'm sorry you never got to the point in three days. It was always go around the circle, and it was always accusatory, more than trying to get the facts out and let the chips fall where they may. They never gave her an opportunity to go into them, you see. Alicia said that despite the indictments for perjury, she was asked next to nothing about the abuse she was alleged to have endured. From her testimony, Owen, I, you know, as I said before, they never talked to me about 1983 and 1984. They don't even know what happened. They, they send me into this grand jury. They are calling me a perjurer, and they have never even asked me what happened. And when, it's kind of hard for me because I want people to know I'm telling the truth. And sometimes some of the things that you have to tell them about what happened or about the perpetrators is difficult. And it would be, I think, a gross injustice if that evidence was suppressed. The fact that I know about the bunion or the knot on his little toe and he has hair on his toes, you know, I can tell you exactly how the hair patches on his feet are. It would be a gross injustice if that was suppressed in the grand jury. I think that would, that would be absolutely a crime. Because in the United States today, when it comes to those kinds of cases, a lot of times the only way that a victim can actually prove that they were abused is by identifying key marks on that person's body that no one else would know. A way to call me a liar and a way to say she's not telling the truth would be to suppress that, would be not to watch. I made you a tape describing Rob's body. For the grand jury, I consider that a key piece of evidence for that to be suppressed, I think, is a crime. I think that is, I think that that is willful, knowledgeable suppression of evidence. And to have that done by a prosecutor, I think that's a crime, and that's a deliberate cover-up. A woman identified as Jane Doe conveyed her anger with the grand jury in a recorded interview with Senator Ernie Chambers, which was reported in the Nebraska Observer on August 31st, 1990, from that article. She was left with the overwhelming impression that the grand jury had wanted only that part of her testimony that might be useful to discredit Alicia Owen. Later, she was to receive phone calls from a male saying she talked too much. Since she had moved several times since her partying days, and except for phone calls right after being investigated by the FBI, had not had any such phone calls, she believed that someone connected with the grand jury was giving out information. Jane Doe insisted that the grand jury was just a setup. To quote Jane, then the fact is also, about halfway through my testimony, in front of the grand jury, it was, it got to a point where I didn't even trust them, because of the fact that they did not want to know about Alicia, or any of that type of stuff. She said that Van Pelt told her how to testify, and why. He wanted her to reveal illegal things she had done in the past, which would have discredited her. She also got the impression that he was going to use her to discredit Alicia since they had both been troubled youths and fell into the same circles. She was informed by Van Pelt that Larry King would not be subpoenaed because he would only plead the fifth. They knew he was a homosexual who had sex with underage boys and that he would insulate himself against prosecution with the Fifth Amendment. He could have pleaded the fifth until his face turned blue, but there was more damning testimony from Paul Bonacci on June 12, 1990. Bonacci, with Larry King, I've traveled a lot of times to Kansas City, and that was usually by car. But we used to go up to Sioux City, Iowa, and we used to take a... There was a chartered plane. It was called Cam Air or something. And they used to fly us up to Sioux City, and we'd stay at a hotel that was right on the river. And he had a boat and stuff, and we used to go on all the time. 
And he, we used to go up there for having sex and stuff, Senator Lynch, were some of the people you met there from the Omaha area. Do you remember that? Bonacci, yes. Lynch, do you remember some of their names at all? Bonacci, Joe Coniglia, guy named Robert Sigler, Alan Bayer was there. The grand jury wanted to indict Bonacci for perjury, but they wouldn't have been able to charge him with conspiring with the other witnesses since he didn't even meet Kerry Caridori until May 10th, 1990. His videotaped statement was taken on May 14th, five days after Owen testified before the grand jury. Because Bonacci's claims were so similar to that of Owen's, the grand jury accused him of perjury. They also accused him of being too afflicted by mental illness to give a reliable testimony. Bonacci and other victim witnesses have reported that Larry King was involved in fundraising efforts for the National Republican Party. In so doing, he arranged for the children to sexually service some of the attendees, often in other parts of the country, at conventions like in Dallas. The FBI was involved in maintaining the cover-up. John DeCamp and Senator Schmidt met with Omaha FBI head Nick O'Hara and got a sense of the extent to which the Bureau was running interference for the cabal. For instance, O'Hara had a framed photograph of Chief Robert Wadman on his desk. O'Hara said to them, You fuck with Bob Wadman? You fuck with the FBI. In fact, the FBI made it abundantly clear that they were interested only in the aspect of the Franklin case that was related to fraudulent activity in the financial sector of Omaha. The notion that children were being trafficked by the same parties who were alleged to be committing fraud in the private sector meant nothing to them. It didn't help that an accounting firm that was auditing Franklin was told that they would not be allowed to disclose anything to do with photographic evidence of sexual activity, or else their employment would be terminated. That evidence was never made available to the Franklin Committee, nor was it ever made publicly available to the FBI. All warrants regarding the raid were sealed by U.S. Magistrate Richard Kolf. By the way, any person who facilitates and or involves themselves in child sex trafficking is eligible for a Class II felony charge. In other words, it is a federal offense and one that the Federal Bureau of Investigation would normally investigate and prosecute. This case presented one of the FBI's worst showings as a legal and moral authority. Not only did they fail to investigate in a manner consistent with their mandate, but they also accused the victim slash witnesses of concocting a hoax and committing perjury. Your tax dollars at work. They failed to mention that Alicia Owen was promised by the prosecutors that if she recanted her allegations, she would not be charged. She was also offered bribes of lenient sentencing and monetary benefactions. It was representatives of the FBI who approached Alicia's attorney with those incentives. There were more denials, and Alicia was indicted again on eight counts of perjury. She was also directed to lie by the FBI and say that she didn't witness and experience any sexual impropriety at the hands of Larry King and his posse. They even got Troy to call her and ask leading questions in hopes that it would trick her into disclosing incriminating information that would reinforce their allegations of perjury. She didn't fall for it. That the FBI would be tolerant of non-consensual sexual deviancy was not a notion that came as a surprise to everybody. In August 1990, African-American agent Donald Roshan sued the Bureau on the grounds of racial discrimination, a suit that he won. It wasn't just racism that vexed him during his time working as an FBI agent. Sexual deviancy also became a factor that affected him. In fact, 
he charged specific Omaha personnel with sexual perversion. It wasn't exclusively endemic to the Omaha field office either. He transferred to Chicago, where it persisted in that office's organizational culture. Subhead 2 of the motion of the suit entitled, The Sexual Deviance Complaint and Investigation, went as follows. In response to his telephonic complaint, a signed sworn statement was taken from Roshan on July 3, 1984. In his statement, Roshan described a series of acts or events which he alleged were evidence of sexual deviance by Special Agent Dillon and other special agents assigned to the Omaha office. Specifically, Roshan alleged that he had personally observed Dillon French kissing Special Agent Terry J. Bowl, a male, at a going-away party for Special Agent Bowl and that he likewise had personally witnessed Dylan exposing himself in the Omaha office during a regular workday to numerous Omaha employees, both male and female. In addition, Roshan said that he had heard reports that Dylan had allowed Bull to urinate into his mouth and to urinate into a beer bottle from which he subsequently drank, and that Dylan had been observed picking out the deodorant block in the men's urinal and placing this block in his mouth. Roshan further alleged that Dylan appeared preoccupied with homosexual sex, kept homosexual pornography at his desk, and had frequently spoken in the office of homosexual acts. Another agent corroborated the account of Dylan allowing Bowl to urinate into his mouth. In response, Dylan claimed to only have accidentally urinated on him. He said he did not expose his penis in the office, but only his buttocks. The Bureau insisted that the homosexual pornography was used as reference material in the investigation of homosexual prostitution. Nevertheless, the FBI was forced to settle on the claims of discrimination and harassment. Certain occult practices, specifically germane to Satanism, were cited as having participants in their ceremonies like Larry King and his associates. From the grand jury's final report, in 1988, an Omaha girl who was an inpatient at Richard Young Hospital described a number of gruesome cult activities which she claimed to have witnessed between the approximate ages of 9 and 12. According to the girl, she became involved in a cult where older male members sexually molested her and killed infants and children to establish their dominance over other cult members. Satanic rituals and beliefs have apparently been practiced and passed down in Nebraska throughout generations. By generations, I am referring to a period of 150 years. There have been a lot of eyes wide shut parties among the state's elites with Larry King among their most enthusiastic participants. Kathleen Sorensen has given an account of her personal experience of being involved with foster children who were victimized by satanic cults in Nebraska. From her statement, We got involved and learned about this subject because we were foster parents and worked with a number of children. And several years back, several of the children began after a period of time and building up trust, began to talk about some very bizarre events that had happened in their past, and they were frightening and very confusing. I really didn't know what to think. We went to the police, and we went to social services, and there was really nothing anyone could do. These children we worked with are now adopted in safe homes and probably would never have talked had they not felt able to trust the people they were living with. There are certain things that are in common in the children's stories that when we talk about devil worship, there are things that come up in every single story, such as candles. They all talk about sex. Sex is without a doubt a part of every area of this, all sorts of perverted sex. That is what you will first hear about the sex, about the incest, and it is so hard to believe. But once we get that, we have learned that we can go on and ask and find out, 
and it will involve pornography. That is always a part of it. Part of the reason is that they can use that to threaten the children. We have pictures. We will show the police if you talk. It makes the children feel that they are in great danger, and they are all very frightened of the law. They talk about the garish makeup that the people in the group wear. They talk about singing that they didn't understand. Obviously, that is chanting, and that has come up in every one of these stories, and none of them call it chanting. There will be dancing. Most often, that will involve sexual acts. There will always be a leader, and they will be very frightened of the leader. These children from a very young age, and I am talking about children who came out of birth homes, the family they were born to, worshipped the devil. That's all I can share, and I don't pretend to be an expert. All I can tell you is what the children have told me. My husband and I say, we know things we should know. That's true, and I thought very carefully before I agreed to do the program, because we have heard so much, and it is so ugly and so frightening that you hesitate to tell it to people. It's very heavy to know. I don't want people running around looking in their closets and not leading normal lives. You don't want to think you are giving people ideas. I don't want people to say, if a child starts to talk about some of this, they probably saw it on that show Kathleen did. But we're hearing more and more, and it is becoming very, very out in the open. And I think it's time for people to know that this is not fun and games. This is not something that we can laugh at or ignore. The children I have talked to have all had to murder before the age of two. That is something beyond anything I could comprehend. But in some way, whether with the help of an adult's hand over theirs, by having them practice, by getting them excited to be part of the adult scene, they do murder. And the evil thing that happens is that they really believe that they want to. They want to do what the older people are doing, and they are praised for that. And that becomes their goal, to be like the adults. There is a little part in them, that natural, good, God-given part, which knows that it is wrong. But in a group, and in the excitement of everything, they want to do that. They enjoy the sex. Children are capable of enjoying the sex. I didn't know that. Well, why would they fight against it? A child will eat a bag of candy if you give it to them. They will take part in these things willingly. When they get out and begin to talk, it is very difficult for them to realize. We didn't realize it at first, that they actually wanted to do it. They are told they will never get out. No one will ever believe them, that there is no freedom, that the law will get you. They are hopeless before they get someone willing to listen. They are threatened with death. Every time a child is killed in their group, they are told, if you tell, this will happen to you. They have every reason to believe that. So even when they are into the foster care system and with another family and begin to feel somewhat safe, they still expect these people to show up on the doorstep. They believe that these people know everyone they're talking to. One teenager told me that she had been told that if she ever got married, that they would fool her, and it would be one of them, and she wouldn't know it ahead of time. They set them up to fail in every area. It is very prevalent in the Midwest, Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri. Some people have speculated recently that these states are headquarters. As you listen to us talk about these things, there will be a natural part of you which will deny much of what you hear. And believe me, we did too. I would like to share this with you, partly in the children's words, so that you can hear the things that they said that nobody could make up, that no child could know. That's what eventually convinced me, along with the deep emotion, the grieving, screeching damage, and hurt that they cry out with as they talk. The children I will be talking about, these are all children that I personally talked to. They are today between the ages of 5 and 17. When they talked, they were between the ages of 5 and 15. When these things occurred to them, they were between the ages of, well, birth, but of when memory enters in, I would say a year and a half to eight. So we are talking about very small children. We are talking about children forming consciences at that time, 
learning right from wrong. These children do not know. They come out and do not know what is right. They are confused. What they did before, that they were rewarded for, is such a horror to anybody else that they are shunned. And most often, they have been in multiple placements. They will go to a home. They will steal. They will lie. They will hurt animals. One little guy would sharpen pencils and try to stab people. I don't mean poke. I mean stab. People don't like that in their homes. They don't have any idea what it is. They just think, we have a weird kid. Many are sent to psychiatric hospitals where they are labeled psychotics, schizophrenics, and who would want them in? I praise God that he brought so many of them into my life and through our home and that there are other families like ours. It is just a movement of the Holy Spirit, the only way I can explain it. I will begin with the first stories that we heard, which will seem horrible to you, but are very mild to me because we have progressed and heard far worse things. The first story is about two little boys who were seven and nine when they talked, and they told about sexual abuse at one point and were very grieved. We talked about good and bad touching, and we thought we really had gotten to the bottom of it. And then that afternoon, the little one began to cry. And when we couldn't get the answer from him, the older brother said, He is probably crying because he was in the room when they killed his friend. That was the first one we knew about. And as they described that, they talked about that particular victim being brought into a room, hands and arms tied, mouth taped, and how there had been X's marked on his body, on his vital organs. That was bad enough. Within a very few weeks, we learned that it was not the adults who had killed that child. It was this oldest boy who was talking. The next person that we talked to was a little boy who was very borderline mentally. He had language problems. It was very hard for him to explain himself. And when he began to come out of it, everyone was startled the way he talked. We were real sure. We knew he had not been around these other children and heard anything. But we began to question ourselves. Are we asking strange questions? Is there something odd about us which makes children come and dump these things on us? The part which made me believe this child's story. He talked about different babies being killed, but this particular one being stabbed. He curled up in a fetal position. He was nine years old when he was telling the story. He curled up in a fetal position, and his eyes got real glazed, and he said, They cooked that baby on the grill. And I thought, he has really flipped out. I mean, I didn't know. And he said, Oh, gross. It smelled like rotten chicken or rotten deer. He then went on to tell us how they would cut out the heart or cut off the sex organs and save them in the refrigerator. A very typical thing that these kids talk about. They worship the sex organs. They kept it for another ceremony. I asked him where the bodies went. I did not get any answers from that child about what happened to the bodies. But the other two boys, who I spoke about first, eventually they talked about throwing the babies in the fire. And I asked about that. You mean they were dead when they threw them in the fire? And the littlest one said, No, no, them was alive, and them threw them. And by this time, we were really getting freaked out. What were we going to do? How can you help these kids? Where do you find a therapist who can deal with this? But God set up a support system. Other families were helping us, and that really helped. The next child I will share about, and I'm going sort of by categories here, how we learned and the types of killings. This little girl is 11 today. She was nine when she first talked. It was a very painful thing when she first started to share the sex things. The sex things are so harmful to the children, and they are so embarrassed, and it is so personal to the children, and they know that they enjoyed that. They know that. We had been through all that. She began to draw pictures of cats, and the cats all had tails that were on the other side of the page, or their leg was someplace else. As we began to work with her and talk, 
She said that she had had to kill a pregnant cat. She first said that they had killed a pregnant cat. We said, how did you know it was pregnant? Well, she could not explain that. But as we got into it, she confessed that she had had to kill the cat. And I asked her, and her description was, with a knife, I put it in her bottom and twisted it. Now you tell me, does a kid know that? If I ask a kid, how do you kill a cat? Do you think they will say that? Those are the kinds of details these children tell us. Later, and they eventually cut the cat open, and that was how they knew the cat was pregnant. And they eat parts of the cat, and the feces and the blood. And again, this was just the beginning. It progressed, and the next time she had to kill a baby, the same way, put the knife in the bottom and twist. The baby was alive, and he was screaming. And that child hears that to this day, and has nightmares and flashbacks. And they cut the baby open, and they ate the baby. They do this so there are no bodies left, and they burn what is left, and grind up the bones. And she talked about that, pouring gasoline on the bodies, and burning them in the backyard. And I used to think that was nuts, but I have heard it enough times now that I know it must be so. We know there are mortuaries involved to cremate the bodies, and that makes sense. The most horrible story about fire that I have to tell, and this is extremely, extremely disturbing. It was a little girl. She was a teenager when she was telling me, and she was describing a barn where they used to go to have their meetings, and they used to gather outside the barn, and there would be chanting, and then, as they went inside the barn, they would be split into different groups. And she was never with any of her family. They all went to different places. And I asked her where she had to go. And she said, I was always in the burning room. And as she went on to describe the burning room, I thought, how she came out of this with any sanity at all, I don't know. She was a very small child. They would take in children, probably preschoolers, and they would hang them from the rafters in this barn. And there would be as many as five or ten hung in a row. They would be fully clothed, which is unusual, because frequently they are naked. The children, like this girl, were all given candles. And you can picture the ceremony as she described it. And the candles were lit, then the adults would go forward and would pour liquid from a cup on each of the children's clothing, which was obviously gasoline or kerosene. And then they would give a signal, and the others would have to go forward and set the children on fire. When they were done, they would cut them down. The first child that this girl had to kill was a cousin, a little cousin. What does that do to you? But you couldn't object because the children that objected were killed. Frequently, she said, people would come in families, not knowing that their child would be sacrificed, and she described the screams when they realized that their child had been killed. This child, about two years ago, just fell to the ground at Christmas time. Everyone thinks that Christmas is such a wonderful time, and she confessed that she hated Christmas. She couldn't wait until everything was put away because all she could hear was babies crying. Christmas is the time when the most babies die. And she covered her ears and cried for two and a half hours and screamed, Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Talk to God and make them stop it! All she could hear is the screams and the babies crying. Christmas for the children I have talked to has been one of the worst times. I have had three children tell me about a very similar ceremony, and I will kind of merge that and tell you how it went. They were taken to a church, and all the children, it is a very festive occasion, and they are taken to the front of the church, and a small child is now brought in. Two of them talked about babies, and they put them on a platform. The adults are all celebrating and dancing and singing, and the children are getting into the spirit of it. And what they are doing is forming a circle around the child. And of course, the child represents the child Jesus. 
and they begin mocking and spitting and calling names. And then they encourage the children to begin doing it. And you can imagine how it gets out of control. And at some point, they hand all the children knives. And then they are all hacking and slashing until the baby is dead. And then they all celebrate because the child Jesus is dead. Kathleen Sorensen died in a head-on collision. Apparently this was no accident. The drivers of the other vehicle drove straight into her car. They had a record of animal cruelty offenses, which were common to people who belonged to the satanic cults Sorensen described. This happened in the township of Blair, where Kathleen lived. Later, a teenager housed in a youth care facility said to a worker, you better watch out, or we will get you like we got that lady in Blair. The same youth described a ceremony in which the participants draw lots for the privilege of carrying out the hit. Many people who tried to bring Larry King's cabal down would die in circumstances that appeared to be accidental, but would be proven at a later date in some cases to be due to deliberate sabotage. One Dr. Denson Gerber conducted an interview with Paul Bonacci about the satanic cults. He had plenty of information to disclose from her report. I've been in this field for an awfully long time. I should have realized that's what these three patients were telling me. It was so horrific for me to contemplate. Taking a two-year-old child and placing it in an open uterus, in a dying woman, to have this child covered with blood. I used denial myself after all these years. This has occurred, according to Sorensen, in Nebraska, and now she's dead. And the same thing that is described, this ceremony, was described by Bonacci as occurring in Nebraska. Oh, he calls one personality a computer chip in his head. He keeps it together by this meticulous, obsessive attention to detail, so that he can give you times and dates that I have never seen in any other child abuse case. I have never seen a child who could do this kind of thing. So that he is an unusual witness. He doesn't fabricate. He'll say, I don't know, if he doesn't know. And then you have what I think that you may have here. You have an internationally connected cult in which persons move from one place to another and have very set rituals and are busy attempting to bring about a force of evil of the Antichrist. Now he knew such things as, for instance, let me give you an example. In discussing the Caesarean section, which was done here in Nebraska, the Triangle, when he was there, the girl was 15, as he describes her two-year-old son, had to have sex with her prior to her death, prior to the hysterectomy, or C-section. The two-year-old had sex with his mother. The mother was a believer. He states that she was not tied down, though she was drugged, and a lot of them had drugs. The baby was removed and the blood drained, the chalice passed, the high priest urinated in the chalice, in the blood. Because part of the way of the reverse Christian belief is to take the blood and defile it. But only the high priest may do it, and he knew it. The baby was dismembered. The next thing that he said is that the child would not stop crying, and so they eliminated that child as well, and ate the flesh. And the mother died and she was also eaten by the cult. And I said, well, what happened to the bones and teeth? And he said that they were ground in a machine, which is one of the ways that they do do it. He described it extremely well. Occasionally, you have to ask a question in a matter-of-fact way. So instead of saying, was there anything done with any body part that was unusual? I said, who ate the eyes? Because part of this ritual is the eating of the eyes. And because the concept is that when you eat the eyes of the fetus or the newborn, you gain sight. That's a Celtic druid ritual, which has been taken by these individuals. And without a change in voice or anything else, he said, Malachi ate the eyes. 
And I said, but you were supposed to eat the eyes, you know, as the third ranking member in the cult. And he said, I was out of favor and was not permitted to eat the eyes. But I have to tell you the detail that he knew about how the rituals are conducted have convinced me he has been at ritual events. There is no other way that this child could know. Larry King and his cabal of ruthless perverts were willing to stop at nothing to cover up their nefarious activities, up to and including murder. The following people tried to expose the cabal and its participants. Many of them died by violent crimes, while others died under circumstances that are considered suspicious. Bill Baker. Baker owned a restaurant in Omaha and collaborated with Larry King in the production of homosexual pornography. He was found murdered by a gunshot to his head. Sean Boner. Victim slash witness Tony Boner's brother. He died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound from Russian roulette. Gary Caridori, chief investigator for the Franklin Committee. Days before he died in a plane crash on July 11, 1990, he told associates he had information that would, quote, blow this case wide open. Andrew A.J. Caridori, eight-year-old son of Gary Caridori. He died in the plane crash. Newt Koppel, a confidential informant for Gary Caridori and his investigative firm. Koppel took an activist position in his fight against the Franklin cover-up. He died in his sleep in March 1991 at the age of 70. Claire Howard, Alan Bayer's former secretary. She arranged many of his pedophilic transactions. She died in her sleep in 1991. Mike Lewis was once a caregiver for Loretta Smith. He died of a, quote, severe diabetic reaction, end quote, at the age of 32. Joe Malik, an associate of Larry King and owner of Peony Park, a facility where homosexual galas were frequently held. He died by gunshot. It was ruled a suicide. Aaron Owen, Alicia Owen's brother. He was found hanging in his cell in Lincoln, Nebraska, hours before one of Alicia's court appearances. Charlie Rogers, rumored to be one of Larry King's homosexual partners. Days before his death, he confided to some of his closest associates that he feared for his life. He died from a shotgun blast to the head. The death was ruled a suicide. Dan Ryan, associate of Larry King, he was found dead in his car, having been killed by strangulation or suffocation. Bill Skoleski, officer of the Omaha Police Department, rumored to have kept a frequently updated file on Larry King. He died of a heart attack. Kathleen Sorensen, foster parent of Nellie and Kimberly Webb, died in the aforementioned car crash. Curtis Tucker, associate of Larry King, fell or jumped from the window of a room in the Holiday Inn in Omaha. Harmon Tucker, a school superintendent in Nebraska and Iowa, rumored to be homosexual, found dead in Georgia near plantation Larry King Associates Harold Anderson and Nebraska-born FBI Chief Nicholas O'Hara used for hunting. What were the results of the Franklin investigation? Who faced consequences? Here are how some of the key figures fared. Larry King was sentenced to 15 years in prison, not for child trafficking charges or any, for anything else regarding child abuse, but for embezzling $38 million from the Franklin Community Federal Credit Union. Alicia Owen was sentenced to 15 years for passing bad checks and for perjury. Having been pressured by the FBI to recant his allegations, Troy Boner withdrew his allegations, which was damaging to the credibility of other victim witnesses. Paul Bonacci managed to find a happy life, falling in love and being involved in his church. He works as a youth counselor 
specializing in protecting youth from suffering from sexual violence, as he did. To this day, many believe that the victim-slash-witnesses fabricated their stories of abuse. Even Wikipedia takes this position, dismissing their stories as allegations. Then again, Wikipedia should never be considered the final authority on any issue. I once knew a woman who had been a television personality in Canada with her own program. The subject of her Wikipedia page came up, and she told me her page was full of inaccuracies. Wikipedia pages are not written by serious journalists and scholars. They are written and rewritten on a regular basis and reflect the biases of those who contribute the data. The next time Wikipedia starts whining about how they need money, don't give them a nickel. They have no credibility whatsoever. Considering what it cost the victim-slash-witnesses of the Franklin cover-up to come forward and how they gain nothing from it, I can see little motivation for telling lies about such highly connected people. Lately, we've been hearing a lot about child sex trafficking. Wealthy and politically connected people were involved in the Jeffrey Epstein trafficking scandal. Recently, a film entitled The Sound of Freedom has been released that was based on a true story about a man who traveled to Colombia to liberate some children who were being trafficked. The people who were profiting from their abuse moved in the same circles as Jeffrey Epstein and Larry King. A smear campaign is currently underway to discredit the filmmakers who made The Sound of Freedom. People like Paul Bonacci have heard it all before. They know how it works. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.